Uh, good morning. You're all very welcome. Special welcome to Mr. Philip Leonard. Uh, next Sunday, the uh, preacher will be Mr. R Robin Fowler. Bible study next Wednesday, Upper Cumber at 8 p.m. Youth Fellowship tonight at 7 p.m., Upper Cumber. Yeah. Uh, remember to sign and return gift aid forms ASAP. Uh, Cumber up, Upper PW are, are having a meal out at the Belfry on Tuesday, the 15th of March at 7.30 p.m. You'll find a list in the festival where you can add your names and choose your menu. Payment to be made to Mary or Joan before the meal. As always, they're subject to God's will. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be back with you uh, once again. And Miles, thank you for your kind words of welcome. In Psalm 134, the psalmist declares, Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. He who made heaven and earth. We do gather together uh, to read and study God's word and to sing his praise. And we're going to do so as we join together in the words of our opening hymn, A City of Light, hymn, Ancient of Days. Very relevant, especially at this time when we know, hear about the situation um, going on in Ukraine. And there's a line in it, when, when the nations rage. So let's stand together and let's sing praise to our God.
Let us still our hearts as we come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you this morning full of praise, full of thanksgiving for all that you have done for us. Lord, already this day, you've given us breath in our bodies. You've enabled us to see another new day. Lord, we thank you that you've enabled us to witness that. Lord, we thank you that you have granted us journeying mercies, that you have enabled us uh, to be here this morning, those who are able to join with us, and also for those who are watching uh, online. Lord, we thank you that you've given them the means of technology whereby they can meet together around your word, even though they are unable to join together physically. Lord, we thank you that we are not going to go hungry today, nor indeed any day, because, Lord, you are the provider of our daily bread. Lord, we thank you that we have a roof over our heads. Lord, we have experienced some rather from very cold weather, some extreme elements uh, over recent days. And Lord, we thank you that you have kept us safe during that. Lord, we thank you that you have kept us warm in our homes that you have kept us safe when we've been out on the roads. And Lord, we do thank you that you are ever present with us. We thank you, Lord, that, that your arm of protection remains around us day and daily. Lord, we thank you that as we gather here this morning, that we, as we come to your word, Lord, we know that we can depend on it completely because it is given by, from you by inspiration from you who does not lie. Lord, we thank you that even though people will scoff at your word, even though people will try to claim that it is outdated, we thank you, Lord, that your word has stood the test of time. And that those words which leap out of the pages at us, Lord, are as fresh and as vibrant today as they were back when they were first written. Lord God, we do thank you that you speak to us through your word. We thank you, Lord, that you challenge us afresh each day. Those who don't know you to come to you and those who do know you. To go deeper in our walk with you. And Lord, we do thank and praise you for each and every one who can say with hand on heart, with full sincerity, now I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to me. And Lord, we know that that would never have been possible if it had not been for the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Guilty, violent, helpless we, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement, can it be? Hallelujah, what a Savior. And Lord, we do thank and praise you that you loved us, have loved us and continue to love us so much that you did indeed send your one and only begotten Son, to die on a cross, to take away the punishment that each and every one of our sins deserve. Lord, it is a debt that we can never repay. But Lord, we do thank you that you do not expect payment in kind. And Lord, how wonderful it is for each and every believer to know that one day they will be called home to glory. What a day that will be, as the hymn writer says, when our Jesus we shall see. But Lord, we must also confess that we have not always worshipped you as we ought. Lord, there have been times when we have sinned against you in thought and in word and in deed. Lord, we, know we can admit to a great number of them, but Lord, we also know that there are many more that we have long since forgotten about. But Lord, we thank you that your word reminds us that you do not treat it or did you do not keep a record of our sins, because, Lord, who of us would be able to stand before you if that were the case? But, Lord, we do pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit at work within each and every one of us, that we would resolve, that we would be determined, Lord, to sin against you no longer, and that we would live our lives day and daily in the manner that you expect of us, the manner that you call us to live, And Lord, as we gather around your word this morning, Lord, we pray that we would know your presence with us. 
We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us that even in the midst of everything going on in our day-to-day lives, that we would hear your voice in the stillness, bidding us to come, bidding us to go out in service, to continue walking with you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Last Sunday, we looked at the opening chapter of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue looking at, through that book, and this, this week, we're coming then to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to read the first 16 verses together. This is the Word of God. You know, brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. We had previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never used flattery, nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved." In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. We end our reading at verse 16, and we give thanks to God for this, his word. Now, boys and girls, it's lovely to see you all out this morning. If you want to make your way up to the front, I'll come down to speak to you for a few moments. Now, as I say, it's lovely to see you all out here this morning. Uh, Last Sunday, if you remember, I set myself a little challenge. I had to try and jump from there all the way down to there while obeying all the rules. I, I couldn't jump onto one of the pews and climb over and then jump down, and I had to be in one go. Of course, I failed miserably. But I was thinking, you were sat there and you were watching it, and you were probably thinking, part of me would love to take part. Now, we're not going to do the same thing today. We're going to play a different game, and the good news is you all get to participate. Now, question for you. Has any of you ever played the game Simon Says? You have. Excellent. I'll see a few hands and a few nods. So you'll know that in the rules of Simon Says, if Simon Says to stand up, 
then of course you stand up because Simon has said to do it. What happens if the person at the front says, sit down? What happens then if you sit down? Yeah, if, if Simon didn't say do it, then you don't do it. Exactly. So what happens if you did do it? Are you put out? Exactly. Right, well, we're going to play, we're not going to play Simon Says this morning. We're going to play a different game, and it's a game I've invented, very similar to Simon Says, and it's called Philip Says. And there are two differences between Simon Says and Philip Says. Number one is obvious. It's the name. Because my name's Philip, I'm not Simon. But number two is the most important rule, and this is the best rule of the whole game. If you make a mistake, so what? You're not put out. One, everybody starts the game and everybody finishes the game. So if, if I said, Philip says stand up and you all stand up, excellent. If I said sit down and somebody sat down, I just tell them, oh, come on, come back up again. And nobody's out. Isn't that a good rule? Yes, excellent. So we'll, we'll try it and we'll see how we get on. Philip says stand up. Excellent. Philip says, sit down. Stand up. Oh, not to worry, not to worry. See, Philip didn't say stand up, but, so he, but nobody's out. That's what I love about this game. Even if you, make, if you make one mistake, it doesn't matter. If you make 100 mistakes, it doesn't matter. We're not going to play 100 rounds of it, by the way, because... Otherwise, we'd all be here in the middle afternoon, and your mummies and daddies would be thinking, we've had the potatoes on, and the potatoes are now ruined. So we're not going to go as far as 100. Philip says, fold your arms. Super. Oh, you can keep them folded, this okay. Unfold your arms. That's there. Don't worry. Keep them folded. Yeah, there we go. Philip says, put your hands on your head. Fold your arms. Don't worry, not to worry. Excellent. Philip says, put your hands down again. Excellent. Philip says, take a sweet. I'll take one time. Philip says, hold the sweet in your hand. Ah. <laughs> now, there are a few. I, I love how you're trying to pretend you're sitting there going, nom, 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 but I'll hold my hand out and hope that he doesn't notice. That's, that's pretty good. I'll give you marks for that. Now, there are a few that have... Now, by the way, you can all eat the sweet. Now, the game is officially over, so... You, can eat, you don't have to wait for Philip to say eat your sweet. You can eat it whenever time you want. Just pre not as, just don't, whatever you do, don't hold on to it until five minutes before your mum tells you that the dinner's ready and then you go, nah, it's time I ate my sweet. Because then your mum would be thinking, I wish he wouldn't bring sweets into church. I'll eat mine in a wee minute because I'll need to talk first. So there are some of you who had their hands, able to put the sweet in your hand. Some of you who weren't. Now, I'm going to ask, I'm going to go over to this side because I think I saw all, all hands that had sweets. But don't worry, because I'm, I'm going to ask you a question too. Those of you who had the sweet in your hand, why were you able to eat it? Or why, did you, why were you able to hold it in your hand? So I suppose the question is, why did you not eat the sweet as soon as you got it? Because that's it's so easy to do, isn't it? But I say the reason why... Because you knew we were playing a game, and you heard Philip say, take a sweet. You didn't hear Philip say, eat the sweet. Now, over to you. Why did you eat the sweet? Now, this, don't worry. This isn't, I'm not grilling you. I'm not being cross or anything. Why did you eat this? 
because it was so easy to do and thought, that sweet looks lovely. And of course, when somebody says, take a sweet, you're not going to sit and hold the sweet in your hand and go, look, I've got a sweet tea. Anybody, any, no matter whether you're young, whether you're older, grown up, you name it. If somebody offered you a sweet, you think, thank you very much. And of course, the first thing that you would do is put the sweet in your mouth. That's what a sweet's for. I remember there was one church I did this. The, the church of, that um, a few years ago, a number of years ago, and I did the same thing. And I also get, the minister was sitting up near the front because he was making sure I was getting on all right. And I offered him a sweet too. And there were some of the children, and they were have the sweet in their hand. There were some who didn't have the sweet in their hand. They were going, I can't do that. Why they threw it away. I thought, yes, I know you can't do that. And I, I'd started speaking to them. And then I could hear a wee chuckle. Because the minister, he was, say, was sitting in a couple of pews back, and he's sitting there going. And I didn't tell him what was coming. So he walked into the very same trap. So don't you worry, even grown-ups can walk into the same trap. It's fine. But it's saying, at, at the end of the day, if you made a mistake, so what? It's only a silly, wee, it's only a wee game. At the end of the day, it means nothing. You're not going to go home this afternoon and thinking, I did a silly thing in church today. Of course you're not. Because there's nothing wrong with eating the sweet. If we don't obey the rules in the game of Philip says, so what? It's fine. No problem at all. However, in the Bible, we have rules. And if we don't obey those rules, well, that's, wor that's much worse. There's a verse in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Last week, I shared with you that verse from Romans chapter 3, verse 23, where Paul said, for all have sinned, all have done wrong things, and fall short of the glory of God. And if, the, if we just left it at that point, we'd all be thinking, well, none of us are getting to heaven, we're not good enough. But Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. An angel appeared to Joseph. Mary was expecting a baby. And we, of course, we all know that the baby that Mary was expecting was the baby Jesus. And an angel told Joseph, and we find it in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, she will bear a son, that is, Mary will bear a son, give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So yes, we know we've all done wrong things, and there's one way in which we can get to heaven. We'll, we'll never get to heaven by being a good boy, being a good girl, by going to church, by going to Sunday school every week. Those are all good things, and they're very important things to do. If you read your Bible every single day of your whole life, that does, that's not enough to get into heaven. The only way that we can get into heaven is by asking Jesus to forgive us, by telling, Jesus that we are, by telling God that we are sorry for all that we have done wrong. And we'll, we'll know some of the things we've done wrong, but we'll not know the rest. But God knows them all. And whenever we ask for forgiveness, he's not just going to forgive you for all the things that you remember, but every single wrong thing that any of us have ever done, God will forgive, them, forgive us for each of them. Last Sunday, I said, if, if we were given a list of all the sins we've done, you'd be thinking, well, I remember that one, I remember that one. No, I don't remember all these ones. But God will still forgive you for all of them. And it's very important, boys and girls, and it doesn't matter whether you're young whether you're old, whether, it doesn't matter if you're primary school, if you're in high school, whether you're an adult, you're at university or you're out working, whether you're a granny, gran, granda, whether you're even, I think the oldest person in the world is a hundred and something, I can't remember what age. Even if you were the oldest person in the world, God will forgive you for each and every thing that you have done wrong when you ask him. That is how we get into heaven. That's the best place that any of us will ever be. And it's very important, boys and girls, that each of us does that. Because 
there's a course that's in. One way, God said, to get to heaven, Jesus is the only way. One way to reach those pearly mansions, Jesus is the only way. No other way, no other way, no other way to go. One way, God said, to get to heaven, Jesus is the only way. So if, we, if you ever play a game of Simon Says and you're put out, okay, not to worry. If you ever play a game of Philip Says and you're not put out and you get it wrong, so what? That's fine. But the, the rules that God gives us in the Bible, they're the ones that we must obey above all others. We're going to pray together and then we go back to the seats and then we're going to sing your hymn before you go out. So let's talk to God. Father God, we give you thanks for the children and young people here this morning. Lord, we thank you for their involvement in the services each Sunday. Lord, we do pray that you would continue to watch over them. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless them. And Lord, we do ask that if they haven't already done so, that they would come to you, that they would ask you for forgiveness from their sin, and that they would become Christians and be walking with you. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So again, thank you for coming up. Um, Hope you all, I'm, I'm glad you all like jelly babies because if I had, if I went to some of you and you said, have you not got anything else? I don't like jelly baby. Unfortunately, I didn't have anything else. So I'm glad that you all like jelly babies as well. So I'll let you go not back now into your seats and we'll get ready to sing your hymn. I'd actually forgotten I have my jelly baby still sitting there. Um, thank you for not running off with anybody in the choir. We're going to join together once more as we sing, Be Bold, Be Strong, for the Lord, your God, is with you. So let's stand together and sing praise to God. At this point in our service, uh, we'll bring to God our prayers of intercession. Of course, there is much uh, to pray for at this time. Um, we know that numbers are 
a bit lower than normal um, due to other, or some in the congregation having to isolate at home, and we will remember there was an all who are ill and unwell at this time. And also, we can't have escaped all what we're hearing in the news about the situation in Ukraine, so indeed we will be praying for that, and also that there will be a lasting peace would come, not just in that region, but right throughout the world. So let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, we do give you thanks for those who are, that we are able to join with us with you here this morning. But Lord, you know that there are many who, for whatever reason, are unable or who are absent from public worship this morning. Lord, you do pray for those in the congregation who are having to spend time at home due to various illnesses and infirmities. Lord, we know that there are some who are having to isolate, and it's very easy, Lord, to, to focus on that and almost at the expense of those who are struggling with other illnesses. But Lord, we do lift up all who are ill, regardless of what is afflicting them. Lord, we do pray that your healing hand would continue to be upon each and every one of them. Lord, we do pray that you would enable them, so strengthen them, Lord, to return to their place of worship at the earliest opportunity. And also, Lord, for any who are having to spend time in hospital at present, Lord, we do pray that they too would be so equipped that they would also be able to return home to their own familiar surroundings. Lord, we do pray that you would watch over them um, in their time, during their time in hospital. Lord, we know how anxious it is at the best of times, but especially now, Lord, when their family and loved ones aren't able to visit with the same uh, consistency as they did a few years ago. Lord, we do pray that you would keep them from feeling isolated, cut off from the world. And Lord, we do lift up their families as well. Lord, we know that the, the pain of separation is also on their shoulders as well. Lord, we pray that they too would turn to you for guidance, for help, to get them through these days. Lord, you remember also those who are absent because they are mourning the, the loss of a loved one. Lord, we do continue to remember those in this congregation who have been bereaved in recent weeks, and indeed all others, those known to us, and indeed those who we have never met, who are going through similar pain. Lord, we do pray that for all such that you would bring comfort to them at this time. Lord, may they know your presence in their lives. And Lord, for those who don't know you, we pray, Lord, that they would turn to you, that the power of the Holy Spirit would move mightily amongst them, that they would realize how fragile life can be, and that they would make steps, they would make preparations to be ready for when God will take them from this life to their final resting place, their eternal home. And Lord, we do pray for the wider church, for the wider world. Lord, we have been, our news bulletins in recent days have been dominated by news of the tensions and bubbling over into the invasion into Ukraine by the Russian forces. Lord, we know that we are living in a time of uncertainty in, in an earthly sense. Lord, we know that the world is a difficult place. But Lord, we know that there is only one who can give a true, a lasting peace. There's only one, Lord, who can bring an end to the bloodshed, to the violence, to the hatred. And Lord, we know that that one is you. And Lord, we do pray that you would bring about a real revival, a real peace, a lot lasting peace, not just in Russia and in, in Ukraine, but in every country around the world, in every home around the world, where men, women, and children would turn away from sin, and they would, they would come unto you. And Lord, we do pray also for the congregations here and in Upper Cumber. Lord, we do pray for them 
even now in the early stages of vacancy. Lord, we pray that when the time is right, according to your will, that you would bring he who you have called to minister here to, to, be, the, to be the full-time minister in this place. And Lord, we do pray for the Reverend Hubbard as he settles into his new charge up in Articlave. And Lord, we do also remember the convener, Reverend Stephen Hibbert. Lord, as he guides the congregation, the two congregations through this time of vacancy. And Lord, in this time, we pray, Lord, that attendance would remain strong, that people wouldn't drift away, but that the congregation would continue to grow, and all for your glory. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Before we turn to God's word, we will sing once more hymn number 588. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. There are many dates in history that, as soon as you mention the date, you remember what has happened. And one such, perhaps, I would say, in, in very recent memory, on Monday the 23rd of March 2020, you might have realized that straight away what, that, what, what was significant about that date. But as soon as I say the next few words, you will re you'll remember it well, I'm sure. Because on that evening, at 8 p.m., Prime Minister Boris Johnson gave a televised address to the nation. 
during which he told us the news we were hoping we would never hear. The country was going into lockdown due to the rise of coronavirus. And as a result, there were various restrictions imposed upon the British people, including only being allowed out for one walk per day. I live out in, in the countryside. I grew up on a dairy farm. We were one mile exactly from the Cookstown town centre. And because I live out in the countryside, because I grew up on a farm, we are surrounded by fields. We're the first house after the national speed limit. And there's the number of fields on our road, once you come past that national speed limit sign, far outweighs the number of houses. And it's fair to say that a lot of people found out about our roads during that time. There's a wee river about half a mile from our house. And then when you go beyond that river, you are well and truly out into the countryside. And I think on that, once you come over the river, there's another three quarters of a mile to the end of the road. And there are three houses on that. And two of them are only built maybe in the last 10 years. So the man who lived there before that, he had, he had plenty of fun. He had no bother with his neighbors, mainly because he didn't have any to begin with. And we noticed, especially in that time of good weather, the amount of pedestrian traffic that came past our house very often outnumbered the amount of vehicular traffic on several occasions. The town people wanted to get away from the town, and they realized, well, if we go out into the countryside, into this wee, maybe hitherto undiscovered road, we can go out, we've got a bit of peace, we've got a bit of quiet, we've got tranquility from the madness that's going on around us. And so our road almost became, as it were, Northern Ireland's newest tourist destination. We've yet to get the brown sign, but you never know, it may still come. And I'm sure some of you are like me, that you enjoy getting out for a lovely walk. And have been doing it even before it became, as it were, popular two years ago. But this morning, as we consider these verses from the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians, let us ask ourselves, how am I walking? Some years ago, I was in town, and I bumped into one of the elders in my home congregation. He was undoubtedly one of the most godly men I could ever meet. And as we chatted that day, he asked me a question. In fact, he hit me with this question that I honestly think I've never been asked before, never been asked since, but it really gave me cause to think. Because in the midst of our conversation, he said, Philip, how is your walk? It took me so much by surprise, I thought, I'm actually out in the car. And then I realized what he was on about. And it certainly was one of those stop you in your tracks kind of questions. Because it does give us an opportunity, doesn't it, to ponder and meditate upon the strength of our faith. Or indeed the weakness of it at times if we're honest with ourselves. This portion of Paul's letter is subtitled, Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians, and in it we see clear direction from his pen to the believers in that city as to how they are to live their lives. In verse 2, they speak of how they had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi. We were reminded last Sunday of how Paul and Silas ministered in that city before being ousted by those whose hearts were hard towards the gospel message that Paul and Silas were proclaiming. In Acts 16, we are given the account of the, their experiences in Philippi. In verses 11 and 12, Timothy by now has joined them, and we are learned. So setting sail from Troas, we made a, dif, a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. From verse 25 onwards, we are furnished with the account of the conversion of the Philippian jailer. And when Paul and his friends were told the next morning that they could go home, we read their response in verse 37. Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The passage goes on there to tell us that in verse 39 that the magistrates were, were scared when they heard that they were Roman citizens. And they did indeed come. They apologized to them for how they were treated and then asked them to leave the city. In spite of all that they are having to endure, their faithfulness 
uh, that of Paul, Silas, and Timothy remain strong. In these faithful servants lies a genuine hunger and a passion for mission. We read their words from the opening chapter last, where we read them last week. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly remembering you in our prayers. And here in the second verse of the second chapter, they declared to their fellow believers, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of such conflict. In the midst of their suffering, they could have been forgiven for adopting a woe is me attitude, everyone heap attendance on us kind of thing. But this was never for them. God was always first. They had a mission to fulfill, and they were determined to do exactly that. They go on to demonstrate that they are ministering because it is the desire of God. And we see that in verse 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. In the verses that follow, we are then given two glimpses of the caring nature of Paul and his friends Silas and Timothy. Having declared that they have ministered to the believers in Thessalonica to fulfill God's call, we see a further statement from them that none of what they do is to seek the glory of mankind. And in verse 7 we are told, But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. This will have resonated a great deal with the num a number of the readers in Thessalonica. Husbands and wives alike would have appreciated the statement, both having seen the care that the wife in, it in the family provides for her children. We only have to read a few more verses before their conduct, before we come to the second of the two references. In verse 10, they speak about how holy and how righteous their conduct has been towards their fellow believers. And in the following verse, they write, For you know how, like a father with his children. Equally, this will resonate with the readers. Those with children bringing to mind the love that they themselves exhibit for their offspring. Twice in quick succession, Paul, Silas, and Timothy demonstrate their caring nature, showing that the love that they have for the believers in Thessalonica is like a parent looking after their children. When they compare themselves to a father with his children there in verse 11, they go on to explain more to their fellow believers. They say, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We know that the church in Thessalonica is a young one, perhaps only about a year old, we but more, we but less. But importantly, crucially, the church there is a growing church. God is bringing men, women, and children to, in that city to a saving faith in Him. And not just in the city, but in the surrounding areas. They are coming in. And the growth in the church is evident to all. The believers there have a mission field, whether they are aware of it or not. And we observed last week how the rabble-rousers drove Paul, Silas, and Timothy out of Thessalonica, and we know about their heart for mission. And we know that they will have been longing, yearning to join with the believers in Thessalonica once again, and to continue their ministry in that city if God wills it. But it doesn't look like that's going to be possible for them in the near future, and they do recognize and acknowledge the supremacy and the sovereignty of God. They have a desire to serve in Thessalonica, but they also know that it may not be where God calls them to go back to, that the ministry in Thessalonica may be now the calling, the mission field of the believers in that city. As believers, they are full of spiritual potential. They are walking with God, and because of that, the Holy Spirit can do a mighty work in their lives, a work which would ultimately see a multitude of sinners coming to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. The believers in Macedonia and Achaia, we saw it in the opening chapter, they had cause to rejoice in how the believers in Thessalonica 
had turned to God from worshiping idols. And they can continue their good example now as servants, leading many more away from idolatry and indeed from every other form of sin which hinders them. In order to achieve this, however, they must remain strong and faithful in their walk. Yes, they are infants in the spiritual sense, but no doubt they will, if only, they'll be only too aware of the events that happened in the life and the ministry of Jesus. They will have been mindful of those occasions where he healed the sick on the Sabbath day or where his disciples were, were walking along the roadside and they picked a handful of grain on the Sabbath and how the Pharisees were lurking, almost prowling like the lion determined to find evidence against Jesus, to, to condemn him, to bring charges against him. The believers in Thessalonica, therefore, will know that the life of a Christian is constantly, continually under the microscope of the world. And so when Paul and his friends exhorted and charged these new believers to walk in a manner worthy of God, they are making them aware of the need to live the way that God has intended them to, not the way that the world wants them to. They have so much to offer in terms of their ministry, and guided by the Holy Spirit, they can achieve so much to the glory of God. But only, only if they walk in the right manner. The world watched Jesus, and it will also watch those believers in Thessalonica with the exact same intention, to catch them out. Paul knows all about trials that believers face. After all, we know before he turned to God, he had the blood on his hands of many martyrs. But he also knows that the stronger the walk, the stronger the faith of he or she who is on that spiritual journey. Their mansion in glory is assured. And if they have a strong and faithful walk and keep that strong walk, God can, God will use them to do a mighty work in his name and for his glory. If someone were to come up to you or me in the street and ask us the same question that I was asked all those years ago, how is your walk? What would our response be? Well, first and foremost, we cannot have a walk with God if we do not belong to him. So we need to ensure, therefore, that we are walking with him, that we are a child of the living God. So I, there may well be someone here and you're not yet in that walk. Scripture says, now is the exact accepted time, now is the day of salvation. If the Holy Spirit is, is knocking at your door, come in. Come in and be saved. But to all who are born again Christians, and I do hope that's true of each and every one of us here this morning, with, with the, amongst the young people who have left us and also now with those all who are remaining in the meeting house. But how is your walk? Now, if we were to give the honest answer, we would say that there is much room for improvement. But we never give a completely honest answer to that question, do we? Now, yes, there will be some who will open up about their struggles and be very open about it. They will talk about how difficult they find opening their Bibles, how challenging it can be to focus on God's Word. They'll maybe tell you that it's how many days, weeks, months, years even since they have prayed. But most of us will keep that to ourselves. Why? Well, it's not an arrogant part on our part. So, I mean, we, we're, well, say we're not arrogant, so of course we do stop short of stating, yes, my walk with God is going fantastically well, thank you for asking. But our pride does keep us from revealing any struggles. Those struggles might be major, they might be minor. And why is that? We don't want to tell anyone that we're struggling in our faith for fear that they will look down at us that they will scoff at us, that they will make us feel inferior. Because if, if you say that I'm struggling in my faith, and they say, well, mine's going pretty well. I'm praying daily. I'm reading the Bible daily. How small do we feel then? 
But who's to say that the, the one who asks us how our walk's going, who's to say that their walk is going any be better than ours? We must all acknowledge, regardless of the strength of, of our faith, that there is tremendous room for improvement in our spiritual lives. The last few days have shown us that the world is in tremendous need at this present time. With the Russian invasion of Ukraine, people are perhaps beginning to be fearful of the future. The world needs a lasting peace. That much is very evident. And the leaders of the greatest nations in the world can get together around a table and they can draw up any peace accord they want. But that earthly peace is fragile. Because all it takes is for one of those leaders to have moved on, whether they've been defeated in an election, whether they have been usurped in a military coup, and the next leader has no intention of honoring any peace accord. And what happens that peace? That peace is shattered again. No, this peace can only come from God. Whether the world wants to accept it or not, she urgently, desperately needs revival. And God's people, you and I, are called by God to play our part in it. I don't know if you've ever considered this statement. But each and every one of you here this morning who is a Christian, and also those watching online, each of, each of us who are a Christian, you are also a minister. Now, of course, when we think of the word minister, we think of somebody who has a title of reverend before their name. And while we don't have that title, we are called by our God to minister in His name. Now, your ministry might solely be an evangelical one, communicating the gospel message to the unsaved of our world. Equally, your ministry may be exclusively a teaching ministry to your fellow brothers and sisters to build them up, to encourage them in their faith. But in all likelihoods, however, each of our ministries will be a combination of the two. We need to encourage our fellow believers in, our, in their faith, and we need to witness to those living outside the kingdom. If we don't do it, who will? The short answer is nobody. It's a, it's a startling statistic, but if you neglect your mission field, there's nobody coming after you to take your place because it is your mission field. It's not their mission field. It belongs to you. Have you got a close walk with God. And with that close walk, are you ready and willing to serve him? A former minister in our congregation once used an illustration many years ago. I heard my dad speaking of it a few times. And it concerned a king, and on the eve of his daughter's wedding, he ordered all in his kingdom, every person, every family, to pour a cup of milk into the palace fountain the night before so that on her wedding day, when the princess woke up, she would look out the window and this fountain that was normally flowing with water would now be flowing with nothing but milk. So the command went out and the people were told what to do. And they all went home and the, the king then went back to the palace and thought, great, I can't wait till tomorrow morning. So the morning came, the king got up, pulled back the curtains and he looked out. And he couldn't believe what he saw. Because there in front of him was the palace fountain. Not one drop of milk was in it. The king, of course, was incensed. He was furious. And he called all the people together as, as we, an emergency meeting. Wanted to know, why have they all disobeyed? Why did none of them do it? And each one of them had the same response. I thought everybody else would do it. I didn't think, therefore, that you would miss my cup of milk. When it comes to ministry, we might think, well, if I don't do it, everybody else will do it instead. No. Because if we don't go out into our mission field, then nobody else will, because they're already away in their own mission field. God is, has called them elsewhere. And in order to fulfill our calling, we must be faithful and obedient to Him. And we need to maintain that close walk with Him. But how do we enjoy that close walk? Well, of course, we've got our continued faithful attendance at worship, whether it be physically or online. 
whereby we are nurtured in our faith through the faithful preaching of God's Word. And that's one vital element that's crucial. But we, a strong believer is not just a one hour on a Sunday or two hours on a Sunday. For any believer seeking to draw ever closer to God, we must be fervent, dedicated, devoted in our prayer lives. We need to obey that biblical mandate that we are to pray without ceasing. We need to be reading and studying God's Word for ourselves. The stronger your walk, the stronger my walk, the more effective we will be as His servants in our world. Knowing that the power within us to minister in God's name comes from God. Let it never be said of any of us as we close that we come to church on a Sunday. Yes, that they can say, oh, he, he or she is faithful in, in their attendance at church on a Sunday. But that that's as far as it goes. May we always enjoy a closer walk with our God, day and daily, and all for His glory. Amen. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.